This is about an experiment. <laughs> Waiting to have our deathbed conversations until we are about to die is a cheat. In theory, it's easier to speak up then because we humans like dying while feeling that we have made a difference. And of course, we hope that we'll have limited time left coping with any fallout. And at that point, there may well be fewer people even left alive to have the talks with, so waiting seems like good tactics. But there's a broad spectrum of ways that we go into the good night. At funerals, it is so often clear which of the dead made clarity and transparency in their tribe and in their ways of living. Their grievers are sad, but are not radiating a stew of complications to grief, bitterness, resentment, and guilt. Those deaths will take longer to recover from. What sports of unspoken conversations haunt us? What landscape do we venture into that we have avoided? The best possibilities stay simple. Forgiveness and apology, acknowledgement, a gift of truth, opening a locked door and saying how much and in what ways we have loved. On February 21st, I'll be a presenter at the Mountains of Courage conference here in, on dialogues on death and dying. And what I wanted to explore was what would it be like to create a kind of cool deathbed. And I don't think that it would have a checklist. Nothing left to apologize for, to ask or forgive or acknowledge. So I made up a game. The poet Mark Nepo writes, you must meet the outer world with your inner world or existence will crush you. All courage is threshold crossing and when you speak using actual words, it gives the other person a chance to show up. So I committed to have in a month at least three conversations that I would want to have had if I knew I were dying soon. I asked my tribe to play this game too so I wouldn't be suffering alone. Pick a dead bed your conversation you were saving pull on boots of courage, use your imaginations, and speak sooner, I said. I wrote some guidelines on my website, and I said, I will come back in a month and ask if you want to tell me a story. So how do we engage voluntarily with a conversation that even our own body may be atavistically rejecting, like poison? It is not always even the possible consequences that deter us. These conversations remain unspoken because sometimes we find it easier to imagine chopping off our own thumb than speaking those particular words. It is a hallmark of some deathbed conversations. When you speak into one, it feels like acute vulnerability, even that you would somehow just die if you speak. But as Brene Brown is out there reminding us, vulnerability, once spoken, actually looks like courage, and it tastes like truth. Disbelieving a personal conviction of death by conversation is just a muscle that needs strengthening. The first week I went in easy, using a fountain pen to thank Professor Robert Gruden. 17 years ago, his book on time was full of such humanity and humor that it dissolved the writer's block around my master's thesis. His letter back to me had me glowing and shy when he wrote and asked that I share my own writing as it might dovetail with his new manuscript. So the second week, I took my husband down to the river and despite that sensation of imminent death, I spoke three secret fears that I live in. It was not a graceful conversation and there were some stunned disbelief on both sides. Yet in the weeks since, I have felt such love from him, and he doesn't suddenly love me more. Rather, removing a layer of armor lets me feel love like rain. This conversation, too, became a gift to our children, feeding a living hope for a marriage that grows in openness and softness and strength, so that they may in turn seek the same for themselves. What if these conversations I keep holding breed more courage and vulnerability in them, down through generations? As my tribe began to tell me stories, I found myself with a front row seat to forays in human imagination and courage, vulnerability and truth, and the kind of beauty that cracks my heart open like an egg. I keep asking more people in to play, and I don't think that I will ever stop. Some conversations were declarations of independence, setting boundaries, refusals to accept being treated carelessly or badly any longer. Many discovered the beauty that shows up in humility. A number told me of speaking into truths around mental illness, confessing it to dear ones, apologizing for actions, or finally speaking the truth about damage done or received. There were acknowledgments to family, former teachers or mentors. Of all who did talk to me, about 20% have not yet had a response, and some may never. But even those spoke to me of feeling lightness and moving forward differently now, and the game surprised me. In a response from an old friend, I received a poem, poem titled, I Remember the Time We Kissed. In part, it went, it was small but memorable, like you. I remember the time you stuck out your tongue. I thought to myself, good thing she's not a lesbian. Please, God, don't let her be a lesbian. 
<laughs> I don't think of what could have been very often. I mostly think of the once upon a time descent from Turtlehead, trading places in the race. All I know is that I'm happy that you have your kids, your husband, your place in the world, that I have my son, my health, my introverted partner who keeps me conscious of balance and longing. No doubt death will show us the truth of it all, or nothing at all, and we'll dance. At least our descendants will, and maybe that will be enough. Playing the game also has this intriguing side benefit. We not only clean up our existing messes, but going forward, we're more accountable to ourselves. In self-defense, I find myself creating fewer messes, holding fewer secrets. I harm less and acknowledge more, because it is also possible to heal what has not yet happened. I hold comfort now differently than I did. I become less ruled by the insistence of my mind's demands for security, and I find myself combing my mind for more conversations that might scare me, like a child begging for ghost stories around a campfire. It's a seductive landscape, holding the thrill of risk as well as the quite good odds for a mysterious and freeing outcome. For these conversations, we must bring our most gallant, frank, and open-minded selves. So perhaps the greatest benefit is in taking in this identity. After such talks held against the medal of inclination, these qualities are then demonstrably who we are. And an honest, humble, and courageous person earns a sweet life and a translucent deathbed. I tell you stories, knowing that inside you are hearing your own stories, because this is how stories work. You listen to me, and you know your own unsaid truths, and you know to whom they might be told. Jumping into the cold lake of courage, we find we swim with peace and freedom and fun. So come on in. The water feels just fine. Thank <laughs> you.